Hello there, welcome to the Logan for Liberty channel. How are you all doing? I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest. I hope you're all having a great day. Today I want to talk about globalism and how the term globalism is basically meaningless at this point. Not that it doesn't have a definition, but it's meaningless in the same sense that racism, sexist, homophobic, bigot, xenophobic, Islamophobic are completely useless now. Racist, mostly racism, like you're racist and you're a sexist, those terms are meaningless. And this video is more of an off-the-cuff type of video. It's not scripted and organized. This is me thinking and then talking. So you're going to listen to me work through some of my thoughts sort of live. It's a live recording. You're not listening to this live in real time. I guess I should say it's a real-time recording. I'm working on my thoughts trying to figure out how I feel about this. But... I was reading an article from Milo Yiannopoulos. He has turned on Jordan Peterson, which is fine. You can like whoever you want. You can dislike whoever you want. That's whatever. The world isn't going to end just because two people don't like each other. And basically the story goes was that Jordan Peterson was in, in an interview. And I didn't see this interview, so I have no idea what this interview was about. But... The interviewer asked Jordan Peterson whether or not Milo Yiannopoulos was a racist, and Jordan Peterson said maybe. And I understand why Jordan Peterson would say that. Jordan Peterson isn't somebody who is constantly watching Milo Yiannopoulos' content, although Jordan Peterson knows who Milo Yiannopoulos is. He probably knows Milo Yiannopoulos like most normal people do for the simple reason that he was has been attacked and has been a staunch attacker of anti SJ or of SJWs. He's been a staunch anti feminist. Although I don't know if I would call Jordan Peterson an anti feminist, but Milo Yiannopoulos definitely is an anti feminist. And what I mean by I wouldn't call Jordan Peterson an anti feminist is I I'd, I'd call him a feminist in the same way that we would consider Christina Hoff Summers the factual feminist. There's a difference. I'm making a distinction, so I figured I'd make that clear. With that being said, Milo Yiannopoulos didn't like that Jordan Peterson said that Milo might have been racist. So Milo wrote an article on his face on his website. I think it's MiloYiannopoulos.net or Yiannopoulos.net or Milo.com. Some, something along those lines. I'm not a visitor of it. I used to be a huge follower of Milo Yiannopoulos. That kind of faded out and I started going into other things. Uh, watching other political commentators and getting my news from other sources. And th that, that, that has a reason. I have a reason for all of that. But that's neither here or now. Basically, Milo Yiannopoulos didn't like that Jordan Peterson said this and he wrote an article. And in my opinion, I think the article is strictly just for the sake of use. Because Milo Yiannopoulos could have reached out to Jordan Peterson. I don't know if he did, but it doesn't seem like he did. It seems like he wanted to capitalize on Jordan Peterson saying something about him. And in that that's kind of a tangent, but the reason why this is relevant is because in the comment section, some of Milo Yiannopoulos' fans, it was, so before I say that, the, com the reaction, the comment section, was kind of mixed. And this post, this article, didn't go over very well. It was post, I saw it after it was posted, it was up for 20 minutes by the time I saw it. And there was only 40 reactions to it that were... And only half of them were generally positive. Typically for a Milo Yiannopoulos post, he has at least 100,000 dedicated followers at the very least. And he could get easily up to a million reactions or views. But in this case, and that's within like the first 10 minutes, just so we are clear that he'll get thousands upon thousands of reactions. On this particular post, on this particular article that he linked to on Facebook, it only got 40 reactions and the comment section was split. And it was split pretty heavily. I'm not going to say it was split in half. It was probably 75% pro Jordan Peterson, the other 25%. You know, pro Milo because they're the most dedicated of the dedicated Milo Yiannopoulos fans. 
Now to go back to the relevancy and you know stop diverging, the comment section obviously there was an overlap between sort of Alex Jones type fans and Milo Yiannopoulos type fans, and there's nothing wrong with Alex Jones necessarily, but they were calling Jordan Peterson a globalist shill. So what is a globalist? And I, when I was a little bit younger, okay, I can't say that I'm acting like I'm wise. I'm 22 now, and when I was 18, 19, and 20, I had this idea of what globalism was, and I felt like I had to oppose globalism. And the way these people use the term globalism, it's, I guess, it's consistent in a way with things they disagree with, but when somebody uses the term globalism, they're quasi-national socialist. They're protectionists. They're uh, pro-tariffs, pro-regulation to keep businesses from leaving the United States, meaning they're anti-capitalist. They're only pro-capitalist when it benefits the interests that they want. This is how I perceive these people using the term globalist as an insult. So, they, they have a, a sense of nationalism, and it's not a healthy sense of nationalism in the way I would say that I have a healthy sense of nationalism. And I'm not using myself as a standard. I'm just, again, making distinctions, differentiating between how I perceive the definition of globalism and nationalism and where my principles and values are held up to these definitions, unlike how these other people tend to define nationalism and globalism and what they consider to be either or. So my sense of nationalism, personally for me, is I have a pride in the ideas of what America is supposed to be. And there, there are white nationalists who like to say that the idea of America was European white culture making this land what it is. And I disagree with that. There is no doubt that the United States was a majority white at one point, especially during the best, most prosperous years of this country when we had a incline, a rise in production and wealth. When we were creating out of almost what it seemed like nothing, in the blink of an eye or the flick of a switch, the United States became prosperous almost overnight. So white nationalists will see this as what America is about, you know, the, the essence of white people, of whiteness. Not that they think white people are superior, but that they think white people on their own is superior as opposed to mixed race. And that's not how I see it at all. I see it in the Thomas Jefferson, James Madison sort of view of American values. The Declaration of Independence, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when the government becomes corrupt and starts violating your rights, you have a right to abolish or change your government. That is what I believe is the American value. 1776 now. Even the Articles of Confederation, anti-federalism, this balance between sub-sovereign states, which in a sense I still think are sovereign, legally, not including case law. And then the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, these are ideas that I believe America was founded on, classical liberalism, not white nationalism. So this comes into play of what they mean by globalism. If I own a business, this is how I believe they perceive it. If I own a business and I choose to increase production and the best way for me to increase production and save money is to move part of my business to a country where labor is cheaper. Some people, the socialists, the left wing socialists would say that I'm exploiting poor workers. While the quasi-socialists, the national socialists, would say that I'm getting rid of jobs. I am shipping jobs. I am destroying jobs. This will hurt America. Those are protectionists. Those are the nationalists that perceive any sort of business. They, they can't separate business and politics. So when they see a company outsourcing jobs... They then perceive that as a threat to the national sovereignty of a country, and I completely disagree. 
because when I was younger, I had always perceived globalism as threatening the national sovereignty of the citizens of a country's ability to enact a government that they consent to. Basically, the Constitution style. So, international bodies such as the United Nations, that's something I'm, I'm against, in a sense. Once the legal framework that they start setting up starts affecting us and our laws are then superseded by that. When the when United Nations, those laws, or something like uh, n the NAFTA, not NAFTA, uh, the, the TPA, uh, I can't remember. Trans-Pacific Agreement, TPA, those f supposed free trade agreements, when they take the, uh, the ability to legislate or to negotiate trade from our Congress, from our elected representatives, to an international bureaucratic body, that, to me, is what I had always perceived as globalism. But it goes deeper than that. As I was explaining, these people, they see any sort of idea, so any event of outsourcing a job or somebody moving to this organization or a treaty with somebody they don't like as a globalist policy, which is why I am sitting here talking about how globalism is basically just a meaningless statement. That is, that, that, thinking about it, it, in this sense, globalism is meaningless because it can mean almost anything, and it certainly means something completely different than what I thought it meant. Sort of like how people on the left, they see nationalism, or they hear the word nationalism, and they automatically draw correlations between American nationalism and the Nazi Germany. National socialists, basically, even though most of them are national socialists, they're just more left leaning national socialists. That's beside the point. But globalism, in a sense, I don't, you see, that's why I hate some of these blanket, vague terms. I, I'm not a postmodernist, I have no problem with categorizing things to make talking about things easier. Categorizing is a ex an extremely beneficial thing because it allows us to communicate specifically about what we are talking about. If I say, hey, go get me a drink, we already know what a drink is, but what type of drink? So I'm not a postmodernist. Globalism, however, is a vague category in the same way that a drink is. If I say, go get me a drink, what type of drink am I talking about? Do I want an alcoholic drink? Do I want a soft drink? Do I want water? Do I want juice? Any any drink in general. Do I want a protein drink? <laughs> Do I want an energy drink? Which probably could be considered a soft drink. And then even those sort of get into their own categories. What type of alcoholic drink do I want? Do I want a whiskey or do, do I want beer, or do I want liquor, or do I want wine? Okay, what type of wine do I want? Do I want sparkling wine? Or, if it was made in France, uh, champagne? Do I just want fruit, you know, basic red wine? Do I want yellowtail? Or if I go into soft drinks, do I want Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper? Does that make sense? And... If I say I want juice, what type of juice do I want? How much do I want? Do I want the added sugar? I hope I hope that analogy is making my point. So when somebody says globalism, what are you talking about? Do you see Ford moving factories in Mexico as a form of globalism? Does that somehow threaten the national sovereignty of your country because they're outsourcing jobs to increase production, which helps every consumer? Not to interject my personal economic beliefs. By the way, Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson, fantastic book. You should 100% pick it up without a doubt. Go pick it up, read it. It's amazing. I have learned a lot. I've learned a lot about tariffs and the economic fallacies that Keynes 
socialists, communists, quasi-socialists, as I like to call them, which are basically Tucker Carlson type protectionists. It goes over all the fallacies that they're talking about. I've been digressing a lot on this video. But like I said, this is 100% unscripted. This is just me working through my thoughts. Anyway, as I've been saying, that is the general problem with the term globalism. As I was asking, what does globalism mean? If we buy, if we import cheap steel from China or we import electronics from Japan, is that a form of globalism because we're getting cheaper products which help the poor people, there's a reason why we're able to afford all of the luxury that we can is because we are able to produce it cheaply. And there's various ways of producing something cheaply, increasing production. You can export the labor to countries that are poor and this isn't exploiting them because these poor workers, these jobs that we export to them are the highest paying jobs that they have in their country. So I already... I was already expecting the argument about, oh, my, my sweatshops. Okay, get over it. Sweatshops are beneficial for the countries that don't have jobs that pay that well. Every developing country has to start out with sweat jobs. You can't just jump from poor to prosperous. It is a journey that you have to go on in order to reach it. Once upon a time, the United States relied on slave labor. After slave labor, it eventually relied on child labor and sweatshops. After that, when we increased our production to the point where we don't need child labor... And we're at a sort of new transition. We're trying to find the right balance between males and females working. That's beside the point. I keep digressing. <laughs> I digress. Let, let me think. I'm trying to get back on topic. Yeah, so it, uh, importing goods. Is that, a, is that a form of globalism? Because a lot of these people who say that any sort of company going international... By the way, Sargon of Akkad is one of those people. I'm not to you know, name drop or anything who believes that a, a business or a company doing business outside of their founding or origin country, that that is a form of globalism that is selling out the national sovereignty of that specific country. And that's just not true. The matter of the fact is, globalism in an economic sense is 100% beneficial. The reason is, is because it helps consumers in the United States have a higher standard of living when we are able to import goods that are cheaply made. We are able to to uh, tr to convert our resources and labor, transfer our, our resources and labor into parts of the economy that are needed or industries that will prop up as a result of saving unnecessary labor that we can give to somebody else and every country will go through this and every country will be on a different level right now uh, the western world and some central points in asia are in the top like if we looked at the entire world we're in the top one percent but that doesn't matter because eventually places that have these sweatshops, they will get past sweatshops and then other places will have sweatshops. And this is beneficial because as nations around us, listen, listen here, uh, border, border advocates. I'm not against borders, by the way. I'm just saying the strongest advocates of borders who are afraid of immigrants stealing our jobs and whatnot, just, or who are afraid of the crime and drugs and sex trafficking coming from the South. Um, Listen to this. If Mexico is rich, if Mexico is wealthy, if Mexico is prosperous, it's more stable. Therefore, there are less immigrants coming to America. A lot of the illegal immigrants coming from the south, they're not from Mexico. They're from farther south of Mexico and go straight through Mexico and they pass Mexico because Mexico is a little more poor than the U.S. Imagine if Mexico was almost just as rich as us. The illegal immigrants from South, South America, from Honduras, from Chile, from Brazil, or from El, El Salvador... They won't have to skip through Mexico to go to the United States. 
they will stay in Mexico because of the prosper from the prosperity that Mexico is able to generate from this wealth that is able to go around. And it's sort of like a domino effect. So Canada and the United States are rich, and then eventually it goes to Mexico. Mexico increases their production. Their consumers are doing well. And at this point, it doesn't really matter because Mexico, a lot of people don't feel the need to seek refuge in the United States. So the only immigrants are from South America. And therefore, if Mexico is prosperous, they're going to be more likely to stop in Mexico instead of trying to go straight up here in the United States. Furthermore, as Mexico be Mexico becomes more rich, theoretically, Honduras, El Salvador, those countries become more rich, and then they don't need to flee as much. So do you see what I'm saying? In a sense, economic globalism is 100% beneficial. Instead of producing steel in the United States, we can buy it a lot cheaper from China, and then we can direct our resources to other things that might help increase our prosperity. There's always this fear by these technophobes, which in my opinion are in the same camp as the protectionists. They look at it short-sighted. They look at the short-term employment instead of the long-term employment. They look at one specific special interest group, which are the groups whose jobs might be shipped overseas or in another country, even on the same continent. But they're not looking at the overall net benefit that will happen, like increased production, and the fact that most of these people, when they put in an effort, they will find new jobs in other industries, and some of these industries will be newly created industries because we can concentrate wealth that was being wasted on this thing that we can produce proficiently, a lot cheaper and move it into another industry that is how wealth is created <clears throat> this kind of went from like a talk to globalism about economics but that's i i guess i, I beat the horse enough that's my opinion on globalism so to conclude globalism is basically a meaningless word it doesn't have any true meaning because the way i see it the way i define globalism which is different from the way alex jones and these people define globalism, although there is an element of what I'm about to say that they agree with. I see globalism as selling out the governing power of the United States to international bodies to govern. Basically, if the United Nations or a global government became the authority over the jurisdiction that the United States hold, that is how I see globalism. That's how I would, that, that that's the globalism I disagree with. But these other people, and I'm not, you know, not, not to dive into the they or them versus us mentality. Although sometimes for simplistic terms, for reductionist reasoning, there is nothing wrong with that. But in this case, these X, group X, and we've all seen this, so don't get offended if you... You know, if you don't like me dividing this conversation into us versus them, but there's certainly an element of that. There are people, Group X defines globalism as anything that would threaten the economic. There we go. I should have said that earlier. I would have saved 10 minutes. They see a threat of economic nationalism, national economy. They, they see any sort of outsourcing, sorry, they see any sort of outsourcing jobs or importing goods as a threat to national economic stability. That is something they include along with my definition of globalism. And it's a meaningless insult in the sense that it's not consistently used. Or maybe it is consistently used. But it's meaningless because anything they don't like is globalism. Even if something that will benefit them in the long run is entirely globalism. Hence why it's a useless word in the same way that racist, sexist, homophobic, bigot are entirely useless phrases because they have been hurled at people who fit in neither of the four categories. People who aren't racist, sexist, homophobic, and bigot, bigoted. Just like certain people use the word globalist as an insult to anybody who might think it's a good idea that we lower tariffs and start importing goods as a result of them lowering, lowering tariffs because we lower tariffs, therefore increasing production. 
And that was it. Um, I don't know if any of that made sense, because towards the end, I'm sort of realizing a hole in my, uh, what would it be, statement, hypoth my, my prompt, my, my writing prompt, in a sense, my theory, my thinking prompt. I, because I guess global, like I said, this was me working through my thoughts, because I guess globalism isn't useless in a sense, it's just silly the way they use it almost no it's it's useless it's meaningless it's basically meaningless anything they don't like is globalism and there's no consistent usage of it i guess anyway this was just me working from, through my thoughts uh i hope they had a consistent narrative even if i did digress off of different topics Thank you for watching Logan for Liberty. Have a good one. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more content, don't forget to subscribe so you can check back and see more future videos regarding politics and culture. While you're at it, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can be notified when a new video is uploaded. Also, check out my links to my Facebook and Twitter in the description box below. Ooh.